I would tell them to really, if somebody came in and asked me about, a young person came in and asked me about being a chef, I would definitely tell them to really think long and hard about it because it's a real, you know, it can be a thankless job, especially in the beginning. It takes a lot of hard work to actually get to where, you know, uh, the hard work pays off. So, uh, yes. You know, I hate to say it, but you can't, you can't teach people to be passionate about what they do. That's something that comes from within, so. Say I have a twin brother and he was a dishwasher at a brewery and he didn't want to go in one day. Uh, so we tried to play a trick where I pretended that I was him and they ended up finding out and they ended up firing my brother and giving me his job. That's how I started off my cooking career. 40 years ago, <laughs> I was a mere child. <laughs> well, most children have lemonade stands when they're growing up. I had a quiche stand in Erie, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and I knew then that it would be beginning of a culinary career. Okay. Well, it, it kind of found me. I started cooking from a really young age. My first real meal that I cooked was at the age of 13. It was Thanksgiving um, dinner. The reason I did it was because my I was born on Thanksgiving as well. So that's kind of another thing with the whole deal is my mom's a nurse. So she couldn't cook my favorite meal, which is my birthday meal, Thanksgiving meal. So I did it on my own that first time. And it was a lot of phone calls to my mom and saying, hey, what do I do next? What do I do next? What do I do next? But it turned out well. Everybody liked it. They came back the following year. So that's kind of how I started. Uh, doing graffiti. And uh, at the time it was art for me, but it was really bad. I figured it out <laughs> growing up. But um, uh, I went to juvenile hall, and uh, after that, my dad um, made me come wash dishes here in Laguna Beach. And uh, I mean, to me, it was uh, it was like the end of the world. You know, what I mean, not being able to draw. I was so busy washing dishes, cutting lemons, doing all this. And uh, but finally, one day, um, it clicked in my head. I said, uh, I wanted to be just like you, Dad. And, um, and I remember coming home from Chem Lab one night and seeing Emeril Lagasse on Food Network and kind of watching him make something. And I'm thinking, like, that was not hard at all. Like, I could, I could do that, no problem. And um, I came home from college like two weeks later. My parents were having a dinner party. And I said, uh, hey, I, I'd like to make this dish. And I had never showed any interest in cooking before. So of course, they were very excited to have me do it. And I made it and everyone at the party was like, oh my God, what, how did you do this? I could never make this all stuff. I'm thinking like, this is the first dish I've ever cooked. Like, what do you mean you couldn't do it? And um, most importantly, you know, the same way I'm sure people get addicted to heroin, it was like this addiction to feeding people and preparing food. Raised to traditional Asian parents and then um, the Asian way of thinking of education and everything like that. But um, I think at one point in my life in Berkeley, California, um, things changed for me. I, I figured I, I don't want to be a lawyer or a doctor or, or whatever they want me to be. I, I want to do something else for a living. And baking kind of fell in my lap because every morning I used to go to Noah's Bagels in the morning and I used to love that place, the original Noah's. And, um, Tell your F, huh? Oh, yeah. man, you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> doing that and started working at some small French restaurants, you know, Italian restaurants, little mom and pop's places where I was, I was working right there with the chef and owner. Um, and then, uh, you know, it was when I walked into Broken Top in, 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 when I was 19 that, that, you know, I saw all these chefs from Food and Wine magazine that were voted the best in the country, uh, top 10 chefs, and, and, and got a chance to see that there was, uh, you know, some, uh, some fun and some, some, you know, a good career that was lucrative in being a chef. And uh, at that time, I had a lot of chefs, the older chefs, uh, that were telling me, you got a knack for it, you, should, you need to, you know, go to school, learn some of the basics, and then, you know. Yeah, I started cooking, uh, geez, I started in a kitchen, actually. I was about 14 years old, washing dishes by hand, three compartment sink, old fashioned, uh, nothing but elbow grease and suds and hot water. Um, and I cooked probably a good, close to two decades uh, in and out of kitchens all over uh, Los Angeles, up in San Francisco, a little bit out in Louisiana. Um, at the same time I was playing music in a band and cooking was kind of a means to pay the bills and pay my rent. I was hoping to uh, 
to advance my music career and realized uh, that that was not going to happen uh, in the 90s. So this was kind of a um, heavy rock kind of what eventually would become like the grunge kind of movement, sort of like Soundgarden, The Damned, a little Led Zeppelin kind of thrown in there. It was pretty. Did you see Soundgarden when they came I did, out? yeah, it was killer. It was great. So I didn't really feel that going to a $100,000 school would really help me that much. I pretty much just wanted to get it under my belt. So I went to a small school in Alabama and I moved to New Orleans shortly after that. And then I basically just walked into Commander's Palace and. Um, stage there they offered me a job and I ended up working there and that's kind of where that's kind of the point when I started taking it serious because I had always cooked at places I had been a line cook you know at bistros and whatnot and just you know I never really took it serious and then I really once I got to New Orleans I kind of figured that that was how I wanted to be and what I wanted to be because walking into that scenario is so unique and it's so crazy and it's so great and i wanted to basically i looked at them and i'm like i want to be like you guys you know first place where i really thought i'd i'd made my way to uh you know to to the to the fine dining scene to the scene that i wanted to be in the, the whole culinary and scene um was at cafe was in hollywood at sunset and vine i was hired as the sous chef there and that was the place when i was like okay this is really cool Got to do a lot of really fun events. Got to cook for a lot of really uh, important and famous people, and and got to meet a lot of great chefs and collaborate and and kind of rub elbows with with some of the best guys in the business. So. <laughs> well, the first couple of restaurants I was in were. I, I don't count my professional career until after I went to school and did my apprenticeship. But before that, I did an apprenticeship for an Italian restaurant in Milwaukee. And that place, you could consider it to be a little bit crooked, um, meaning that they, their business was not just restaurants. So it was a lot of fun seeing the people come in and out for other reasons besides dining. But I did learn a few things from these people, and one of them was humility, because the people I worked for were completely arrogant but they didn't know what they were doing. So it taught me that even if you have the business, you have to be able to run the business. It's funny because I thought I was ready to be a chef and I thought I was this, you know, I know how to do all these things, you know, I know how to make, you know, uh, you know, all these stuffed lamb rack with lamb testicles and crazy things and how to make foie gras terrines and, you know, all these things that were you know, made you feel like you really knew everything. And I went on this interview for the sous chef position at the Red Lion. Um, and I got there and the first question that the chef asked me, he goes, how do you make clam chowder? And I didn't know, because I had never made a big batch of clam chowder. And I said, well, you, you steam the clams with white wine. And he was like, okay, thanks. And that was the end of that, you know, so. In the beginning, I think when I did new recipes, I was so like gung ho and I, I kind of rushed it all and I was like, it didn't come out good. You know, but now that I'm old, I, I feel like now I'm seasoned. So now I, I could, I'm a little bit more like, uh, we could give it more time. I still, till this day, I, I'm like a kid when, I, when I'm taking bread out of the oven. I just, I, you know, it's just, it's a baker's thing. It's just like, Grant Atkins book is the first day he ever went into the French Laundry he saw Thomas Keller sweeping the floor and I thought that was real cool. <laughs> that you know that goes back to people being called chef when they're not it's what does it mean to me yeah. to be called a chef? Yeah. Um, I just I work my ass off I mean I, we're, we're here 14 hours a day and we, we sacrifice our family lives and um, we sacrifice our the fun we used to all go out and have in our 20s and you know now we're we're all very professional people that I uh, like to have fun at work but I think that 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 title being of, of being a chef means you need to inspire people uh, as best you can and you, sh you should be working harder than everybody else in your kitchen. Uh, well here at this restaurant my average day starts in the garden every day uh, I typically you know I'll get here in the morning it varies 
time-wise, depending on the day. But uh, you know, I've got currently have 40 tomato plants out there, and I, I'll spend one to two hours out there, and then I come inside, start prepping. Uh, again, it, it varies day to day. You know, some days are really heavy, some days are a lot lighter. Fridays and Saturdays, obviously, are the busiest day with the most stuff to do. But um, it's an all-day thing. You know, come in in the morning, leave late at night, and a lot of work, man. Yeah. It's a lot of work. It's, it's, you could ask that question, what does it take to be a five-star, five-diamond chef? It takes a lot of things. You can't be just a good cook. You have to be a good tactician. You have to be a good psychologist. You have to be a good financial person as well. You have to know so many things to be a good chef. If you can only cook, you can't be a great chef. Because if you can't be profitable for your business, then you're not going to be a business. Therefore, you won't be a chef in that place anymore. I think that someone has to have an open mind and try and read and see and taste a lot, but mostly they need patience and perseverance. Um, I think people expect to start working and become a rising star immediately and it doesn't quite. There are a few people on television that that works for, but 99% of the people, you need to be patient. You need to do things over and over and over and to master the skills and to just keep persevering because there's a lot more down times than up times and you need to be able to, when the cake doesn't rise or the something gets burned, not get frustrated and just, you know, start again. <laughs> Keep going. You have to have passion. Uh, you have to have some sort of stubbornness because you're going to be tested every day and every day is a new challenge and it's hard. It's not like everybody thinks it is, but you have to just kind of put your head down and go to work and love what you do because there's really not a lot of people out there that are going to understand what you're doing. Um, uh, we are serving at least 500 sandwiches a day and it, the business is just, we're just getting busier. And uh, in order to maintain the quality and the integrity in food, uh, we just do not cut corners. We get here early and we make sure we're ready for any surprises. So we do not have to sacrifice quality. So when that huge wave comes, we're, we're already five steps ahead of it. So just, uh, w you just have to anticipate your guests' needs in order to get the food out as fast as possible. Now the cooking industry has really become like a Hollywood scene and, and everybody knows that with the Food Network and everybody's, you know, now anybody, you know, somebody's babysitter that cooked for them now is on, gonna win Chopped, you know, stuff like that. And, um, you know, so when we had talked before, I had said, you know, hey, you know how it is here. And, and the reality of things is, you know, I don't like, I don't get up in the morning and go down to the French place and, you know, get some, some baguette with jam and have my latte. And then I go to the farmer's market and I pick out carrots and beets and things and oh look this will be great for dinner tonight you know I'm gonna make this you know it's more of I come in and I'm like okay who's not gonna show up today you know who's gonna who's calling out sick who's gonna be late you know what's not gonna make it on the truck that I really need I'm gonna get in ahi that's this new product I'm trying out on a Friday and and Thursday it came in bad and and I call the fish guy and I say, hey, this came in bad today. I need to send it back and I need, you know, this much more for tomorrow. And then he calls me and says, texts me in the morning at seven o'clock and goes, oh yeah, the, the vendor didn't fill our order. So none of that's coming in today. And I say, well, what did you send me then? And he says, well, nothing. And I said, okay, thanks. And he says, well, I can try and get you something and I said well you know what I've already taken care of it because it's Friday and I'm gonna sell 50 pounds of tuna you know by four o'clock today I can't deal with that so that's more how my day goes I, I have a real passion for it I'm right now I'm 13 13 years into it 
and I still I try and learn something new every day even if it's just how to run the dishwasher more efficiently but you know you know show me a chef that grows his own food and I'll show you a chef that's passionate about his food I kind of want people to open up their perception on Mexican food Latin food um, whether it be Cuban or Mexican, whatever it is, that it's not just burritos and tacos and, um, I don't know, your, your basic stuff, churros, that you can have a good, well-composed plate like our chicken roti, which is roasted chicken, achiote, which is a, a anato seed from Yucatan. But just that there's a lot more to Latin food. There's a lot more depth and flavor. There's a lot more culture. There's a lot more... I guess togetherness and family that kind of brings this food together. A lot of bold in your face flavors. We put a ton of pride and heart in everything that we do. I mean from making, we make our own bread, we make our own butter fresh every single day. We try and do everything we can in-house and our heart and souls are into it. So um, going into the restaurant you should at least know that the people are they're preparing your food really care for it. In cuisine. So we're talking about gluten-free, very healthy, like our carnitas. We don't cook them in lard. We actually braise them. We do um, um, uh, French pork chops. All of our sauces is made from scratch. And it's actually very, very difficult than what most people think that Mexican cuisine is. But it's very, very flavorful. I mean, it's farm to table. Everything's fresh, organic. Um, down to our steaks are certified humane, grass-fed, and all of our fish is nothing but just the freshest. So we use the freshest ingredients. It's an honor to be here making the best cuisine here in uh, Laguna Beach. Good people um, providing a good place to have a good time. It's pretty simple, you know, but I think in my travels it's pretty rare too, you know, it really, you, you know, I think that, that it's a business, you know, and business is, is business and you ha in order to survive you have to make money. Um, but, y you know, you, uh, that doesn't mean it, do it can't be cool, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so, yeah, and fun, exactly. And, that, and that's really, you know, there are times when it's less than fun here, but um, that's because we're, we're pushing ourselves too, you know, we're really, we want to be, we, we want to be great on every level. And so there's a kind of, there's a mix of, of fun and creativity, but there's also a seriousness about making, making the Boathouse Collective a great place. More about going to the markets and seeing what's available, going to the farms and seeing what's available, and then making my menus around that. For me, I, I design my menus produce, then protein. For being open a month, I couldn't have asked for a better crew of cooks. Like, they really, you know, I told them, I'm like, I'm going to put it on you hard, so, you know, just be ready, and they, they always live up to it, you know? Yeah, they step up, which is hard to come by, you know? We run a small kitchen, there's five people back there, you know? And we feed a lot of mouse. And we feed a lot of mouse. <laughs> we feed a lot. For, for me, I'm, like I said, I'm excited about certain restaurants that are out there. And really, it's about the simplicity of, of food and the, and the product that they're putting out. I, I, I respect and appreciate chefs that, that don't overdo food too much, you know? Um, I think you get uh, a better experience for myself, you know. I love um, just simple meat, fish, poultry. Uh, I saw it, I saw somehow how art plays in food and so does music. I think like somehow there's this common thread in art, food, and music that uh, you need balance in, in food and you need balance in, in sound and, in, and balance in art, you know. Um, you know, food it needs to be sweet and it needs to be sour or it needs to be hot or it needs to be cold or spicy. It, you know, it has these different uh, ranges and uh, in order to find the balance. And same with art, you know, finding the perfect contrast and, uh, and music is the same. So um, I've always been heavily in, you know, um, into music and art and food. It just makes perfect sense to me. But the excitement's still there. Once it's in the oven, you know, you're kind of like, oh my God, please, please just come out good. That's all I, please just come out good. But It's hard to get people to really take interest in what they're doing, which 
when it's your passion and, and it's your livelihood, this is what you do, you know, and it's you're fully consumed by it, time-wise, mentally, everything else, and then you're trying to put that on to other people, but they really don't get it. I think Orange Ooh. County definitely has gotten a bad rap, but I think in a lot of uh, cases it's with good reason. If you look at uh, over the years, what we were looking at 10 years ago were basically all chain restaurants. You know, you had Claim Jumper, Chili's, uh, whatever, TGI, TGI Fridays, those kinds of places that were popping up in all of the, the communities, all the strip malls and all the, the areas where people were building houses. I think um, there was less risk that uh, the ownership of these properties had to deal with and they weren't necessarily willing to take chances on young and, and uh, exuberant chefs. Before I moved down here, I, I always heard about the orange curtain. And I never really understood what that was or what that meant. But it definitely, uh, it's definitely has its own distinct feel and lifestyle to it in Orange County. Yeah. It was definitely a change for me going to Orange County and the expectations of uh, of of the the community and and basically having to to tailor what I want versus what the guest wants. And a lot of a lot of people don't understand, you know, the time and effort that goes into uh, making things. Like whether it's a three-day process of duck wings or just you know the general everyday restaurant stuff. That's why chefs get so butt hurt when everybody tries to come in and like substitute stuff. It's like you know, if you really want a chicken Caesar, I'll make it for you, but, you know, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make cool food and share it with people, and, you know, when you come in and try to switch everything around on me, it's just, football it's league. frustrating. So I get judged every night by the performance of my team by however many guests times however many plates. And it's not judged on based on what I think is good. Food is subjective. So I'm building a team that's got to create something that averagely has to be an 80% success across the board. The amount of food bloggers and you know critics out there now is pretty amazing. A lot of people get a voice on the internet who didn't have one before, and you know more power to them, I guess. But uh, I mean, I don't know how to say any of this nicely, so I'm just gonna <laughs> not. But they just don't know. They don't all know what they're talking. About. It's just, some do, some certainly do, and some have the right to, you know, criticize, I guess. Everybody's a critic, so whatever. I, I, the biggest problem for me as a chef is you make all this stuff and you put passion into it. You know, that goes along with the chef-driven, you know, it's got passion behind it, and then, you know, you're never going to please everybody. That's the hardest part. Somebody's always going to think it sucks, even though you know it's awesome, so. And um, I'm not sure exactly what makes any particular place like a food, what do they call them, food mecca or, you know, a legitimate, like what you're kind of asking is, is, you know, will Orange County ever be like legitimate? Well, we're, we're trying to start a revolution. As far as food goes, it's come, I mean, in the last 10 years, this county went from absolutely no food scene with chilies and TGI Fridays being where everybody went to like the gastropub movement, which is still thriving, absolutely, to um, almost, almost I feel like the return of fine dining and customer service is coming back. We've seen a big turnaround, I think, in the last five years uh, with some great restaurants, you know, and, and chefs that are uh, aggressive and, and taking challenges. And, and I think what you're seeing also is that people in Orange County are excited about that. They don't want to have to drive to LA for good food when you know you can have it right here in your backyard. And, and uh, I think we are becoming sort of a new, uh, new hub of great restaurants and good dining, great bars and, and experiences. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's off the beaten path enough where I thought we could create something really special by, by having the right element of food and music and art and uh, expression and, and being open to families. I, I mean, I have kids of my own and I've always wanted some place where I could go with my kids and sit outside like we are and, and have them sit down and do an art project while I'm having a glass of wine with my wife or have friends gather here and have Sunday brunches. So um, I really wanted to create a unique location and unique offerings for the for the creative people in Costa Mesa and the surrounding areas because there's a as we all know there's a there's a rich history and and a rich 
community of artists around here that uh, that I thought if I created it, they would come. And my I think food in general, I just make the things I like and feel like you know I like this. So hopefully other people will too. You know that's where I start with it, and then it's always just kind of inspired by uh, you know things I ate or things are going on or things I saw where I'm like, oh, this is a cool idea and how do I, you know, I don't ever just take an idea and remake it directly, but I'll say, how can I, you know, make this the next level or, uh, you know, make it my own and that type of thing is usually the way I go about Something it. Something else, but, but when in doubt, little salt, little lemon, little butter, it'll get you closer to where you want to be. So, <laughs> Like everybody else, and I start building planter beds in my backyard and I start growing plants in the backyard, produce. Then you got the dogs ripping up the drip lines and you got weeds and you're spending all this time messing with these planter beds that you're not really getting much done so it wasn't as efficient. So I kind of fell back on you know, some of the farming that I'd done and when I was 15 years old I had gotten into hydroponics. So I fell back on that and started playing around with growing hydroponically. And then within about a year, a year and a half, I you know, ran into aquaponics just online, found somebody who was kind of doing it in their backyard. I was talking about it, called that guy up and he says, Adam, there's really no place to go. You got to just kind of do it yourself and just build the system and learn by trade. So, don't try to <laughs> razzle dazzle me with any of that fancy scientific stuff. I think that we're coming into a new a new world, a new a new food driven destination. I mean, I think that people are starting to take note that you know in Tuscany and whatnot, everything that you do is so that when you eat you eat well you know every you know everyone's making their they make their own wine or you know you get the right people together for dinner and you have these longer meals that are in a beautiful scenery and lots of interesting fun things to eat and you know what I think we need to get away from as much as possible is like okay I'm gonna have the 14 ounce ribeye with the mashed potatoes and you're gonna have the grilled salmon with the avocado salad and we're gonna sit here and talk and you're gonna have your meal and I'm gonna have mine I just like that's so boring I just think that there's so many delicious things to eat and so many different flavors to have that the time where you would just go and get your own huge meal and that would be what you ate I just think that that's dying I think that that it's becoming a lot more common to go to a dinner where you share and where you try lots of different things and for me at least like that's the only way I would want to eat like that's what's exciting to me about food is little bites here and there and different textures and flavors and colors and parts of the world and you know that's one of the things I think is so cool about food is it it's a passport you know if you want to go to Japan I mean I can take you to Japan I can take you to Germany I can take you to Mexico and I don't even you don't even have to pay for the plane you know it's like I can I can build you I can put you in a position where I can feed you something that is the same way that you would eat it in another part of the world and especially if you've already been there before and perhaps you have a positive memory that's already you know aligned with that dish like I can take you back to that memory and you know it's time travel and it's it's to a different part of your life and I think that's what's so special about it and we've as a, as a country we for so long have seen food as like not you know almost a chore I mean the fact that people eat in their car you know the, the fact that you, you know you sit there and you go through a drive and you eat in your car or you eat standing up or you you know eating out of paper bags and it's just like there's gonna be a time when that doesn't happen anymore you know I mean and, and uh, maybe maybe not in our lifetime or whatnot but I think that food just becoming what people want to spend their money on. It's becoming now an experience that people want to live. It's no longer just sustenance. It's not just nourishment. It's not just like, okay, I'm doing this because I'm hungry and I need to put food in me. It's like people are making conscious decisions about where they want to eat, planning their meals. And it's fun to be a part of someone's planned night. You know, I mean, someone's excited to come here for a month and they get to come here and they leave saying it was amazing. What's better than that? I mean, it's really hard to live up to a month of expectation, two months of expectation. It's hard enough to impress somebody when they just walk in and have never heard of it before. It's even harder when someone's been, you know, relying on it or checking the Yelp reviews and thinking it's going to be so good because we have 1,500 reviews and four and a half stars. And it's like, it's hard. It's hard to impress somebody. Um, and, you know, that's always our goal. And I think that as, as we grow more in, into the food culture that I think we're heading towards, uh, I think people will become a lot more forgiving with ex trying experimental food. And I think more importantly, people will become more, more opinionated about eating junk food, eating garbage. You know, if you're going to eat something that's not good for you or it's not made with good ingredients, I just think that's going to become something that people do less and less. I think the diner that I love to see is somebody who's open-minded and, and out 
for an experience and then also that wants to try and share a lot of different things and, and bring a bunch of other people with you too. So it's always fun. Like I said, time is everything about everything. You know, I think sometimes the chefs even too, they're so rushed. They, they're in a rush. They have like 200 covers in a row. So they're like expediting like crazy. But if you gave them an extra 10, 15 minutes to really fine tune everything, you're going to have the best meal of your life. And I went in there and I became his fish cook by just having big nuggets and saying that I can do this and not being afraid of the food either. It's real easy for people to be afraid of what they're going to do in the, in the kitchen. Don't ever be afraid. Always experiment and, and be bold. Life as a chef is very demanding. I think it's very unique. And I think a lot of people don't understand the sacrifices you have to make in this industry. But at the same time, it's equally rewarding. Um, it's equally satisfying to create a dish that has to hit all five of your senses. It has to smell good, it has to taste good, it has to look good, it has to sound good on the menu. And just the fact that you put a smile on a random person's face kind of makes it all worth it.